No, the human skeleton, and the reason we ta start talking about cartilage, the human skeleton initially is made up of cartilage. And I'm like, so we have to start somewhere. So we're going to talk about, you know, how do we go from cartilage to bone? What's happening to make the cartilage? What happens when we want to go from cartilage to bone? But your human skeleton starts off as cartilage. And some of the cartilage remains. We find cartilage on the ends of long bones. We find cartilage connecting bones. And so it still is part of our skeletal system. Now, skeletal cartilage, like car both cartilage in general, um, has very high water base. So the majority of cartilage is water. That allows it to kind of squish. It's got some give to it. However, it has no blood vessels and no nerves. So cartilage itself has no blood vessels and no nerves. Now, this is why some people pierce cartilage. And I'm like, because it in itself does not have nerves and it in itself does not have blood vessels. Um, however, that doesn't mean the skin around it doesn't. That won't hurt. You know, Mikey won't feel it and it won't bleed. But the bad part about not having blood vessels, blood vessels bring nutrients. So if you do damage cartilage, it takes a really long time to heal because they don't have blood vessels bringing lots and lots of nutrients. So if you ever pierce or damage any type of cartilage, it takes a really long time to heal because they don't have blood vessels or nerves. So any nutrients they, did, they get is just kind of some, from some surrounding tissue. Now, skeletal cartilage is like, they all contain chondrocytes. What's chondro mean? Cartilage. What do you think site means? Cells, cartilage cells. So all skeletal cartilages have cartilage cells in the lacunae. And now, and I'm like, when we looked at our skeletal system in lab, the lacunae were the spaces where we had osteocytes. Well, in cartilage, we have lacunae. We have spaces where we have chondrocytes. Cartilage versus bone. They both have a lacunae. They both have spaces, and they both have their own cells. So they have got spaces that have cells inside of them. And you have all of this extracellular matrix that's all around it. And there are three types of cartilage, based kind of on what fibers we find inside of there. But there are three types of cartilage. Hyaline cartilage, it gives us the most support, flexibility, and it kind of bounces back. There's a lot of resilience to it. The fibers we find in it, lots and lots of collagen fibers. Places we find hyaline cartilage, in articular surfaces. What's articular mean? It's like a lab question, too. And I'm like, anywhere where we have movement. Two bones are moving, they're articulating. And so I'm like, we have a hyaline cartilage covering articular surfaces. And I'm like, it's articular cartilage that covers the ends of long bones where movement happens. We find it in costal areas. Can you guess where the costal part of your body is? You're like, I know, I always say it. It's the ribs. This is like our ribs, our costal cartilages. Our respiratory system, and I'm like part of our larynx. This is all hyaline cartilage. And our nasal cartilage, our nose that you can squish. That's all hyaline cartilage. Elastic cartilage, very similar to hyaline cartilage. Still has collagen fibers, but it also has another type of fiber called elastic fibers. So what happens when you pull elastic and let go? It bounces right back. And I'm like, so they have all of them, everything like hyaline, but they also have some of these elastic fibers. So they're kind of more a little rubber bandy. Um, this is your external ear. I can pull on the external ear, and it will bounce back um, quite easily. Your epiglottis that sits there and bounces back and forth when you're eating versus breathing um, or drinking versus breathing. Um, it's also made of that elastic cartilage that can sit there and bounce back and forth. And our third type of cartilage is fibrocartilage. We talked about this already today, Bob. Has really, really thick collagen fibers. So it's stronger. It has a little bit of give, but not a lot. In the places you find it, the menisci, the lateral medial meniscus at me, and those intervertebral discs in between all the vertebrae. They're nice, they're strong, they've got a little bit of give, but not too much, because we don't want to tear it, and we want lots of support with them. Kind of a picture, oops, a picture where you can see some of these, your fibrocartilage. We also find it at that pubic synthesis between all of your intervertebral discs and your knee, your elastic cartilages, 
your ears, you can pull, and the epiglottis is not shown on there, and your hyaline cartilage, it's all the blue, around every single long bone or bone where there's movement, you're gonna find that hyaline cartilage. Now, like you find it in the rib cage, your costal cartilages, the cartilage of your nose, we find the majority of our cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Now, the growth of our cartilage happens in two ways. One is appositional growth, cartilage grows wider. We've got some cartilage, it grows wider, appositional growth. Cartilage also grows longer, that's called interstitial growth. So our cartilage, as it gets bigger, as a fetus is growing, it has to grow wider, appositional. It also has to grow longer, because the baby wants to grow longer too. And you've got interstitial. Now, what can happen to the cartilage? It can calcify. And so we can add calcium to the cartilage to harden the cartilage. Now this happens during normal bone growth. It happens when you're young, it happens when you're old, is we can take cartilage and we can calcify it. Now, calcified cartilage in itself is not bone. Bone tissue looks completely different. And I'm like, calcified cartilage is just cartilage with calcium, so it's harder. And I'm like, it's not bone. You know, it doesn't have the tree ring looking shapes or anything else. But it happens, our cartilage, even throughout our life, it starts to harden as we add calcium to it. Now, to help make all of this cartilage, and I'm like, we also need, I was gonna say, well, I'm not even gonna go like, to making the cartilage. There are cartilage cells, those are chondrocytes. But we also need to start making bone, since we can calcify our cartilage, but yes, cartilage will turn into bone. I'll talk more about the switching over in a little bit. Um, but our bones need to grow as well. So our bones grow the exact same way as our cartilage do, as in long lengthening and widening. When our bones, not cartilage, get wider, it's called appositional growth of our bones. When our bones grow longer, this is wider, we have, um, I was gonna say, bone lengthening. I was gonna say, I don't have that on the, my next slide. Um, but we have bone appositional growth. Our bones are growing wider. This doesn't mean just as you were an infant. Your bones can grow wider between now and next month if you want them to. Now I'm like, it depends on what you're doing with your bones, but it can occur all throughout your entire life. How your bones grow wider, you've got two major types of cells that are doing building and breaking down. An osteoblast, anything osteo has to do with bone, Blast starts with a B, and it means build. So osteoblasts are bone building cells. And they will lay down new tissue on your periosteum. Now, if you remember, here's my long bone. Not the greatest long bone. And I'm like, the outside surface is covered with a layer called periosteum, which just means it goes around the bone. And so your osteoblasts, and I'm like, are gonna start adding new tissue. So we're gonna start adding new tissue, making this thicker and thicker and thicker at the periosteum, widening the bone. However, if our bones get really wide, what also do they get? They will, they will get longer. Some, not always though. I wish I could, mine could get longer. And I'm like, they're gonna get heavier. And we don't want really heavy bones. So as your bones are adding, the osteoblasts are adding bone tissue to make them wider. And I'm like, we need to get rid of some tissue on the inside. And so your osteoclasts are breaking down some of the bone on the inside. So your osteoclasts break down. So your periosteum lays down on the outside. Your osteoclasts remove bone on the endosteo, the inside surface layer. And our bones start to get wider and wider. That doesn't mean they're getting you know, thicker. They can get a little bit thicker. Um, but we're making them wider and wider and wider. Now, usually we have more building up than breaking down, hence the wider part. They will get thicker and stronger but since we have osteoclasts breaking down on the inside surface, they're not gonna get like, you know, too heavy. We don't want like the thickest, thickest bone ever or we'll be walking around with all this extra weight. So 
So that's growing the wider. Our bones also grow longer. It's called bone interstitial growth, just like cartilage. And I'm like, interstitial growth in the cartilage, grow, they grow longer. Now, for our long bones, they, they grow, I was going to say, they add all the tissue, uh, tissue on in the ends as they grow longer and longer and longer. Um, near the end of adolescence, your chondroblasts divide less often. What do you think a chondroblast does? Based on its name. It's a cartilage building cell. So as you're, you know, you're hitting late adolescence, late teen years, your cartilage cells are dividing less. Because a lot of times we like to lay down cartilage before we lay down bone. So your cartilage cells start to slow down. And where we find a lot of cartilage in our long bone, and I'm like, if you remember, you know, way up here we have our spongy bone. Yes? Okay. And I'm like, and in the spongy bone, there was a line called the epiphyseal, epiphyseal line or plate, depending on what, the, what it's doing. And I'm like, right at that epiphyseal plate or epiphyseal line, you have cartilage. So yes, we have cartilage on the ends of bones, but we have cartilage right there as well. Now, when you start getting into late teens, or for me, early teens, and I'm like, the cartilage right there, those chondrocytes, the, or the chondroblasts, they start to slow down. They start to lay, you know, not make as much tissue right there. Because when it lays down tissue, this gets wider and wider and wider. It happens down here too, it gets wider and wider and wider. You get taller and taller and taller and all your long bones grow longer. But when that cartilage, the chondroblasts that are found right there at the epiphyseal plate, when they start to slow down, that cartilage starts to disappear. And that big thick plate of cartilage now becomes a tiny skinny little line and that's when we actually consider it an epiphyseal line. Is there really no cartilage there anymore? There might be a little bit of remnant of some, um, but we have no more, you know, no more cartilage being laid down. So no more long bones growing anymore. It's called epiphyseal plate closure. It's closure, it's the end of growing. Now that means all long bone lengthening ceases. Um, and I'm like, Yes, and I'm like, the cartilage that might be there might be a little bit, but mm, we're not laying down anything new. Um, the bones of the epiphysis, the ends, the ends, fuse with the diaphysis, the middle, it all becomes one fused thing. Females, their long bones stop growing at approximately 18 years old. Males stop growing, their long bones stop growing at approximately 21 years. Now, there are some bones that seem to continue to grow a little bit longer than others. Any guess what part of the body, the bones, grow a little bit longer than that? <coughs> your feet, the long bones in your feet. <coughs> they seem to continue to grow a little bit up until about the age of 25-ish. Um, so if you're like, well, I'm like, you know, 20, uh, my feet, your feet might still be getting bigger. So you may still need to go up a couple more shoe sizes as your feet get bigger. And I'm like, they're like the last ones to stop growing. Now, what bone is made up of? Um, bone matrix. And I'm like, so bone consists of extracellular bone matrix and a bunch of different bone cells. Matrix and cells. It's like tissue and cells. Now, the composition was in the matrix gives some characteristics of bones. And there's two main ones. We even talked about it in lab last time. Um, the bone cells that are there help make the bone matrix. And then they usually get stuck in it and then trapped in it. And I'm like, and we can find them there. And some cells will turn into another type of cell when they get trapped there. Kind of like I've got a couple different breakdowns. But the composition of your bone, matrix, cells. Some of the major cells, we'll talk about osteocytes and osteoclasts. What are osteoblasts? Building cells, osteoclasts. Breaking down an osteocyte, and I know it'll come up. They just kind of maintain. And I'm like, your extracellular matrix, we have some organic components. 
What's organic mean? Contains carbon. Then I'm like, yeah, and then we have some inorganic, some non-carbon carbon forming matrix. <coughs> By weight, your mature bone matrix is about 35% organic and about 65% inorganic. Get quicker. So in back, you're like, oh, it's about 30. Oh, oh, shoot, I just wrote on the thing. <laughs> I can get it out. Trust me, I've done it before, but whoops. 35%, that'll be up there for the whole PowerPoint now. And I'm like, 35% and 65%. Rubbing alcohol gets this out. Um, so majority is your inorganic. See what happens when I go from lectures to labs? Labs to lectures. Now, eh, it kind of blends in. Bone is formed by the hardening of the matrix, hardening of all this tissue that hangs out with the cells inside of it. So the cells, osteoblasts, build, they add all of this new matrix. So our osteoblasts are laying down the organic tissue and helping lay down some of the inorganic tissue. But once the osteoblasts start building the tissue, they get stuck in it. It's like they secrete all this matrix around themselves and like, look how good I am. I'm secreting all this matrix around it. And then they get stuck inside of it. And they're not going to lay any more down because they're completely, you know, entrapped by this new matrix. And they become an osteocyte. Now, if I've got my one of my stuff, an osteocyte. I don't know if I have it on here or not. Um, an osteocyte, I'll just tell you now. An osteocyte is a mature bone cell. So an osteocyte is just a mature bone cell. It's not building, it's not breaking down, it just helps maintain your bone tissue. So it's not building, it's not breaking down, it's just maintaining your bone tissue. So they lay out bone tissue down, they lay it, they become trapped in it, then they're like, oh, I can't make any more. Okay, I just become mature then and just help maintain that matrix that surrounds me. Now, the organic component, that 35%, the carbon base, and I'm like, things that we find in organic, collagen, that's 90% of your organic component of your bone tissue. It provides strength and flexibility. Now, what happens to bone if you bake it and remove the collagen? It becomes super brittle. Now, like that collagen allows it to bend and give a little, you know, give a little. That's 90% of your organic component. The other organic, this is like kind of like your living tissue, is we have lots of cells. We have osteogenic cells. These are bone generating. They're kind of like your original uh, stem cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, um, osteoclasts and bone lining cells. I know I've got a slide come up about these cells. Then we have some protein sugars. So we switch, we smush the two words together, proteins and sugars. It's like a protein sugar molecule that give our bone a little bit of strength as well. Our inorganic, our main inorganic, and yes, there are it is part of these big, huge, long words. The inorganic that makes up the majority of the matrix is calcium. Yes, we can find it in a big, huge molecule called calcium hydroxyapatite. There you go. And I'm like, in calcium phosphate, but it, calcium is our main inorganic. Phosphorus, which we find in calcium phosphate, is kind of our second big inorganic. I don't hear a mic. So calcium makes about 39%. Phosphate comes in second around 70, 17%. And it's that calcium that really makes our bones hard. So that when you jump, there's some, you know, there's support there. Now, if you don't have enough calcium, what will happen to your bones? They bend. And I'm like, so I've kind of got my next little picture, and I'm like, this is showing what happens. If I take out the calcium, you can bend the bone. This is, you know, if you soak it in vinegar, um, you can remove the calcium. And you can bend it. It becomes very soft and flexible. And if you remove the collagen, 
which gives it some flexibility. And I'm like, it becomes very brittle and can shatter. So we really need these two to work together to make it strong, yet flexible. Now, what can happen um, when you're starting to talk about some of these, um, getting enough calcium is called rickets. It causes what's known as osteomalacia. The word itself means bone softening. If a child is not getting enough calcium in their diet or enough vitamin D, then where can we get vitamin D? Our, our skin can make it if it goes in the sun. But if you're in a mic and we find it in milk products, if you looked at your milk containers, um, we can find vitamin D in milk. We can find it, you know, we can make our own, get it from the sun. But if children, this seems to affect children and infants and toddlers the most, if they're not getting enough vitamin D or enough calcium in their diet, and I'm like, the vitamin D helps calcium uptake. Um, like, otherwise, it just goes right through you. And I'm like, their bones become too soft. And it becomes very evident in the bones of their legs. They start to bow out. Now, again, this usually becomes very common in toddlers that are still breastfeeding that never go outside. And I'm like, because they're getting mother's milk that is not vitamin D fortified, you know, even though they're getting calcium, it's not uptaking due to their skeletal system. Um, and if they never go outside, they don't make their own vitamin D, so they're not getting enough vitamin D. So it usually happens in toddlers, and I'm like, that are still nursing. Can they go away Yes, it can. And I'm like, um, depending on how long it can go for, and I'm like, they may have to put braces on to try to straighten the bones out. And I'm like, now, from what I've heard, I think they even had do you, guys, do you guys ever watch the show, like, the untold stories of the ER? And I'm like, oh, I love that show. And I'm like, they had it where, like, this boy, I bet he was probably, like, seven years old, came in and, you know, pay, pain in his legs every time he tried walking. They couldn't figure it out. Um, the parents were very, very young and naive is my nice way of saying it. Um, were very, very young, and apparently this kid apparently ruled the roost in the house. Um, and all he wanted to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner was oatmeal, and the parents let that happen. Um, and so he didn't get the correct nutrients. He wasn't getting the calcium in his diet whatsoever. Um, and so he actually developed rickets. Um, and it's very rare to see that in older children because they're probably getting milk somewhere, whether it's at schools or daycares or somewhere they're getting milk and they're getting vitamin D. They're usually, I mean, you can get orange juice now that's calcium fortified. Um, but it's pretty rare to see this in older children because um, it has to go on for pr quite a while where you don't have calcium or vitamin D. But I think they had to put them in braces and they fixed it, but the parents got a big lecture um, on um, you're the parents. Now, another thing that can happen, and I'm like, because I'm just talking about it here and I need to talk about it somewhere, because um, I don't think I have a slide, Oop. is another disease that can happen is called Paget's disease. It's not always a specifically a calcium deficiency that causes uh, Paget's disease. Usually it has something to do with hormones um, and some of the cells not, you know, knowing when they should break it down. And you start to have excessive bone breakdown. And it's usually not very uniform. And I'm like, so sometimes they start to have you know, kind of disorganized looking bones, you know, like instead of having all of your, you know, the tree ring looking structures going top down, they might start to turn sideways a little bit. You know, the bones start just getting off a little bit. And I'm like, it's another disease that can happen with bones. It's just kind of have weird bone breakdown. Now, since we are talking about calcium though, that was my side little thing. Um, since we are talking about calcium, um, functions of calcium. Calcium, you know, you've heard it before. Drink more calcium, it's good for your bones. It's not the only thing that calcium is good for. And I'm like, calcium is needed for your cell membranes. We're moving calcium across. We're trying to keep everything homeostasis. Our neurons need calcium. And I'm like, again, creating various, you know, high, low um, concentrations. Our muscle cells, when we get into muscle contractions, they need calcium to contract. Our heart cells, because they're type of muscle too, <coughs> need muscle to contract. So we need calcium in our diet, not just to make our bones strong, but other cells in our body need calcium as well. 
Now, there are two hormones, no, these hormones, that I'm like that help regulate calcium in our body. Calcitonin, it's got the word like calcium right in it, and the parathyroid hormone, which doesn't have calcium in it, but it has to do with calcium. Now, we are losing calcium and phosphate ions all the time. So it's not just like, okay, I need to drink a lot of milk and then I'm good. I don't ever have to drink milk again or get any other type of calcium. And I'm like, we're losing calcium all the time. In blood, um, we lose it in urine, we're losing calcium. So we need to replace all of that calcium. And I'm like, through our diet. Now, if you are not eating foods that are high in calcium or drinking um, milk or other beverages that have calcium in them, and I'm like, we still need calcium for our muscles to contract and for us to survive. And if our body is like, okay, well, we didn't eat it, so we need calcium, let's go to the place in our body where we already have lots of calcium stored in our skeletal system. Your body will start to break apart your skeletal system to get the calcium it needs because it's not just a bone necessity. We need calcium elsewhere. Now, we'll get into that bottom one in a second, but I've got my little teeter-totter to show you what can happen with these two hormones. So I'm like, right all over it if you want. But, and I'm like, we need approximately 9 to 11, I won't ask you a specific number, a 9 to 11 milligrams of per 100 milliliters of calcium in our blood to maintain any loss of calcium. Now, if you, you know, decide you know, you're just gonna eat oatmeal all day, um, and I'm like, you don't get any calcium in your diet. You know, you drink Mountain Dew and don't eat anything with calcium and whatever else, no calcium whatsoever in your diet. And I'm like, your blood le calcium blood levels are gonna go down. But we need calcium in our blood for all of our muscle cells and our other cells in our body to survive. The parathyroid hormone recognizes falling calcium levels. And what it will do, it will tell osteoclasts. What do osteoclasts do? No, nope, it says it up there, but my shortened version of it. They break down. It will tell osteoclasts to break down bone. Because what's in bone? Calcium. And then it will release calcium into the bloodstream. Yay, we now have calcium back in the bloodstream. Good for the cells in our body. Bad for what? The bones. But the parathyroid hormone, that's its job, is to maintain, to make sure there is enough calcium in our blood so that all the cells in our body get the calcium that it needs. If it doesn't get it from your diet, it's gonna get it from your bones to maintain. Now, the opposite hormone, calcitonin, see I didn't have it on the side, I'm like, what do you think it does? Parathyroid hormone helps break down bone. Yeah, and I'm like, calcitonin is like, if you just got done eating like a plate of cheese and then you followed it with a milkshake or whatever, and I'm like, you just have a whole lot of calcium in your blood, calcitonin's like, oh, some extra calcium. And calcitonin is the hormone that tries to put calcium into your bone. So calcitonin puts calcium, calcium into your bone when you have a lot of it, and parathyroid breaks bone down when you don't have a lot of calcium. So the two are trying to work together to try to hopefully maintain calcium levels in your body and try to make it so that you have enough calcium in your bones as well. Now, some structures, and some of this we kind of went over because of the lab structures. Um, some membranes that we find in our body, the periosteum. This is, it's a double layered membrane that covers the whole outside of long bones, only places you don't have that periosteum are the ends of long bones. Because what's here? Cartilage. So we don't have the periosteum there, we've got that articular cartilage there. Otherwise, every other part of the long bone is completely covered in this outer periosteum layer. Now it does, it does have two, you know, it's a double layered membrane. The outer is a fibrous layer, which is why even on the picture, even from lab, if you tried to pull off the periosteum, there is a fibrous layer underneath there. And the main cell we find there, and I'm like, are osteogenic cells. Anything gen means generating, you know, we're making something. These are bone-making cells. 
These are our stem cells. So what do you think bone making cells are making? Any guess? They are going to be making bone. These are, you know, these are the stem cells. These are the cells that are going to make other bone cells. So your osteogenic cells are going to make osteoblasts and osteoclasts. You're going to have lots of blood vessels on the outside of your bone. You can see some on the picture. Lots of nerve fibers. And any tendons and any ligaments, like ones we're already learning up in lab, when they attach to bone, they're attaching to that outer surface. They're attaching to the periosteum layer. On the inside of the bone, because there's a cavity inside here. It's always filled with something. But there's a cavity. So on the inside, we have an inside layer. That's our endosteum. It covers all the internal surface. So of the medullary cavity, it's going to cover some of that spongy bone, so it covers all the trabeculae, that's all the rods that make up the spongy bone. Lines the canal in the middle, lines all the canals, so I'm like part of your central canals, it lines everything on the inside. And it also has osteogenic cells. These are your stem cells that can become osteoblasts or osteoclasts if it wants to. Here's just a big picker, picture showing outside periosteum, inside endosteum. Lines everything on the inside of the bone. Now, of all the cells, there are five major types. We've talked about some of these already. Um, each have their own special you know, job. An osteogenic cell, also called osteoprogenitor. It's like the beginning of making bone cells. These are active stem cells. We find them in the periosteum. We find them in the endosteum. I already mentioned it. These are the ones that can differentiate into other cells. They can become an osteoblast if they want to. They can become a bone lining cell. Some just like to stay as is. They don't want to become anything else. They're like, I just like to be a stem cell. The osteoblasts, these are the bone building cells. So I've got bone forming. They're the builders, it starts with these. So they secrete all of that bone matrix that will become mineralized, but they secrete it unmineralized. So they make collagen, they secrete collagen, they secrete calcium binding proteins that yes, will bind some of the calcium to harden it. And they're actively mitotic. So they undergo meiotosis. Osteoblasts can now become two osteoblasts. Two osteoblasts can become four. Just looking at a picture, here is an osteogenic cell, your basic stem cell. Osteoblasts, and I'm like, I was like, I'm like, they're nice and square. You know, if you're gonna build something, you'd stack up nice square bricks. They kind of look like little square cells. Osteocytes. These are just your mature cells. They maintain. We find a lot of them in the lacunae, the little spaces, because they got stuck in their own spaces, because they probably were an osteoblast. But they're maintaining your bone tissue. They're maintaining to see, you know, do we have all the collagen we need? Do we have all the calcium we need? What else is it we need? Um, they're maintaining. So their job when they're trying to maintain, and I'm like, is you know, what's going on? And then sending information around. So they respond to and communicate different types of stimuli. They may tell osteoblasts, ah, oh, you guys better start building some more bone down. Or they may tell osteoclasts that you need to break down some bone. And I'm like, so we've got always, you know, some new bone is we're building bone, breaking down bone. So these osteocytes, they're just trying to maintain, keep everything the same, nice fresh bone bone lining cells. These are flat cells because they line things. They're nice and flat. And then we find them bone surfaces that are believed, we don't know for sure, to help maintain some of the bone matrix. So there are things in our body we still don't quite know what they all do yet. 
So we think these bone lining cells help maintain bone matrix. We don't always know. We do find a lot of these on the outside surface along the periosteum. And when they're found on the outside, we call them periosteal cells. Oh, we find some of these that line the inside, and we call them endosteal cells. So we think they just try to help maintain bone matrix on the outside and on the inside. They just line the two membranes there. And then we have our osteoclasts. They're derived from a hematopoietic stem cells. It's a blood-making stem cell. So our blood cells, you know, don't always stay. And I'm like, and they become a macrophage. What's a macrophage mean? Big eater. Macro means big, phase means eat. And I'm like, these cells, because what is their job? What's an osteoclast job? Break down bone. So these are our big eating cells. Now, they are giant multinucleate cells, and I've got a picture, for bone resorption. And they have a ruffled border. So I'm like, this large multinucleated, these are all the little purple nuclei, cell, and on the one end, they've got this ruffled border. Main reason we've got this ruffled border, any guess? I think it says on your slide. Just like having microvilli. Increased surface area, because enzymes are gonna get secreted from here to break down bone. The more surface area you have, the more enzymes can get released, and the more surface that you can use to break down bone. So huge, huge cells for breaking down bone. Some functions of our bone. One function of bone, and I'm like, is for support. Because generally people are like, ah, yes, it's there, you know, it supports everything. Um, and for protection, I'm like, our, you know, it supports our body, all the things that are inside of it. It's supported, it's all supported by our skeletal system. It's there for protection. Our main vital organs are encased in bone. What are some of the most important, you know, not just the ones that are all listed up there, but what are the most, some of the most important organs we have? Our heart, and I'm like, that's a whole thoracic cavity. Our brain, that's we've got our skull. Some of our in intestines, although you can you know, lose a few intestines and live. And I'm like, but I'm like, our main vital organs all encased in bone, so huge for protection. We also use it for movement. And I'm like, if we wanna move around, muscles have to attach to something, or we would literally be a big old glob like it is up on that picture up there. And I'm like, if you had no bones for muscles to attach to, you would just be a moving blob. <laughs> all over on the floor. But muscles can attach to things and now we can move our entire body. So we use these muscles attaching to bones as levers to be able to move all around. It's there for storage. We can store minerals and various growth factors. Biggest mineral, calcium, is stored there. So in case you, know, you go a couple days without getting any calcium in your diet, you won't die. And I'm like, you're fine, you know, your, bone, you know, your bones will break down to release calcium, um, but we use it for storage. There's some other growth factors that get stored there. We won't get into those, though. Um, blood cell formation, it's known as hematopoiesis. Poiesis means making. It's another word for making. Um, anything heme means blood. In our red bone marrow, we make red blood cells. So it's part of our skeletal system. We also use it for triglyceride or fat storage in our bone cavity. Where do we find that? It's the yellow marrow. I don't have a yellow, but it's the yellow marrow that we find in the medullary cavity that you can eat. Um, that's fat storage. We've got a little, you know, it's not huge fat storage, but we've got a little fat storage right there. And there is a hormone that's produced in our skeletal system called osteocalcin that helps regulate bone formation. So it's like, you know, calcitonin helps regulate some bone formation. There's another hormone called osteocalcin that regulates bone uh, formation. And they've also noticed that my people that are having hormone problems with osteocalcin seem to have, and I'm like, it seems to have some effect. And so they have an effect if they've got, you know, not correct osteocalcin. It seems to protect against obesity. It helps with glucose or sugar intolerance and with diabetes. And so if your osteocalcin levels are off, it can have other effects on the body as well. 
You know, its main job is to help regulate bone formation, but there's some other things too. Oops, too fast. Now, altogether, there are 206 bones in our skeleton. How many do you guys have to know? For Tuesday, any guess? It is not all 206. Any guess? It's close. 200. Now, you do have to remember you do have two halves, so whatever you have on one, you know, one arm, you double down the other, and same thing for the leg. You know, and like you've got, oh, if I do the math, 56 phalanges altogether. There you go, that's like a fourth of all the bones. And on my eggs, so, you know, they don't have any cool names. Um, the ones you don't have to know yet, you know, Mike, are the ones in your ears. And I'm like, you don't have to know those. But we group these, so some of this is some lab review. We group all of those 206 bones into our axial skeleton, right down the middle of the body. Um, and your appendicular skeleton, bones of the arms and the legs, and the girdles, the pectoral girdle, pelvic girdle, that help attach those arms and legs to the axial division. Some parts of the long bone, I don't want to go too long because we talked about this when we looked at lab stuff. The diaphysis is the middle part. Um, we've got compact bone on the outside. We've got the medullary cavity on the inside. The epiphysis, and I'm like, or epiphyses, plural, and I'm like, are the long, the ends of the long bones. This is where you're going to have spongy bone in there. They're covered by that articular cartilage, the blue on the ends. Um, you may have an epiphyseal plate if you still have growth occurring. If you don't have growth occurring, which I'm guessing most of you are not growing taller, and I'm like, you now have an epiphyseal line. Now, looking, and I'm like, to see an epiphyseal line versus an epiphyseal plate, um, you can see this on a long bone. And I'm like, to see which one is which. Which is like, if you ever, you know, I'm like, if you like the TV shows like Bones and CSI, I like them. Um, if they come across a skeleton and they want to know, you know, approximately how old someone is, they can look, they can x-ray the bone and look to see, is there an epiphyseal plate? There's still cartilage there? That means, you know, that's an adolescent or a child still growing. And I'm like, if it's an epiphyseal line, they at least know when it's adult. And they're like, of course they know, just by the length. Trust me, there are adolescents taller than me. And I'm like, and so they can't just go by the length of bones and be like, oh, they're tall. They totally have to be an adult. And I'm like, there are sixth graders taller than me. And I'm like, and they're still growing taller. And they're going to have an epiphyseal plate so they can kind of date it, whether they've got that thick cartilage, the epiphyseal plate, or the epiphyseal line, like we all do. Um, your compact bone, another word for compact bone is called lamellar bone because all the lamella are the rings and so all those tree ring looking structures, sometimes they're called compact bone lamellar bone. I don't know what picture I have next. An ASEAN, you know, I'm like that's one big, it's not a dark very dark marker. One ASEAN or one Herversion system is like one big tree for the tree rings. We call the whole thing an ASEAN or we call it a Herversion system. It's these rings that make up our compact bone. Now, they do run the entire length of the compact bone. And so they would run the whole thing, you know, this would be coming at you. And I'm like, but it would run top down. All of those rings would go straight top down. Now, the rings, I was going to say, it's called hollow tubes of bone matrix. So I don't like to say that they're hollow because they're full of bone matrix. And I'm like, are called lamella. And I'm like, I'm like, the rings. And these rings run in different directions. It's not just like every single ring, and I'm like, runs up and down. They run in different directions. And I'm like, my picture. And I'm like, these rings. And so here's three different rings, one inside of each other. The fibers that make up one ring can run in this direction. Another one can go in this direction. Another one can go in the opposite direction. These rings, the fibers run in different directions, which means if your bone twists, you know, if you turn the wrong way and your bone twists, and I'm like, the bone itself has some give to it. And I'm like, because of the twisting of the different rings. That doesn't mean if you don't, you know, if you twist it enough, it will snap. And a twisting snap is a really hard one to fix. Um, but it's got some give. 
because those rings run in opposite direction, the lamella do. Some other things, um, in the middle of the ring, you have your central canal, also called the Herversion Canal. That's where you have your blood vessels that run from the top of the bone to the bottom of the bone. You've got your perforating canals, uh, Volkmann's canals, whichever one you want to call it, that connects one central canal to another one. This one's going to the outside. And I'm like, so they just go at right angles, I'll say to the central canal. Um, they, cl they connect blood vessels. So you just don't have blood running up and down. You've got blood running side to side too. You've got blood everywhere. The lacunae are the, all the little tiny spaces, the little gaps. They have osteocytes in them. They look like the little bugs on the models. And the canaliculi, which the word means little canals, these are little tiny hair-like canals. I don't know if I've got a better picture. There you go. And I'm like, I need my pointer. I'm too short. I think I have my pointer. Yes. Nope. Not that thing. If you can see, so you've got three rings here, kind of a little sports one. And I'm like, the little tiny canals, they connect, they connect from one ring to the next. So you've got all these little tiny canals. That's your canaliculi. Little tiny canals is what the word means. Little canals. Now, how do we get all these little tiny canals? Because they're everywhere. They happen when the bones were being made. When the osteoblasts were making new tissues, and I'm like, that's their job. And I'm like, they want to be able, if they can, and I'm like, to still maintain contact with each other. So it's like one bone building cell would like to hopefully try to be in contact with another bone building cell. It doesn't always happen, but they'd like to be. And I'm like, and so they try to create these gaps that allow the cells to interact with each other. Now, eventually the bone cells, bone building cells, the osteoblast, mature and become osteocytes. And then they get entrapped inside of the rings and then they are still connected to each other, which works out well, because what does an osteocyte do? It maintains. And so we're not building anymore, but now you have these cells all over that are trying to maintain the bone and they are connected to each other. And I'm like using those little tiny canaliculi. So the cells get trapped in there and it allows them to still communicate with each other. And I'm like, they can move waste around, they can move nutrients around. We just now have a little connection between all the rings. Now, the rings, the lamellae. We've got two types of lamellae. One we've normally been talking about, and then one other. <coughs> <coughs> now, <coughs> sorry, the, <coughs> the lamellae are the rings. Now, two rings. I have a interstitial and a circumferential. Imagine that there's lots and lots of rings in here. I don't want to draw them all. Now, I have three, three, I, you know, I've got three osteons. They all have rings. They all go in nice, perfect circles. Every single one of these is a circumferential. What do you think of when you hear the word circumferential? It's like a word that's inside of there. A circumference. Circumference, if I can spell. Which means they go completely around. They are perfect circles. That's your circumferential lamellae. They're like, well, what's the interstitial? Do you remember what inter means? Like an interstate? Intertubercular groove? Inter means between. When you have circles, meeting up with circles, they don't fit perfect. They're not like squares stacking up on top of squares. And you end up with this in-between tissue. That's your interstitial lamellae. So they're incomplete lamellae because they're not rings. They're not part of the whole osteon. They're not part of the tree. They just fill the gaps. The 
circumferential. There are the full circles. They go in different directions. They try to resist twisting. So you're going to find it everywhere on the edges of your long bone. I was going to say, here's just showing some, like, you've got all these tree rings. And I'm like, but then you've got spaces in between where you've got that interstitial lamellae. I was going to say, here's two tree rings, some interstitial lamellae. Now, a little bit about the spongy bone. One, um, it appears poorly organized. But because I have the word appears, is it? No, it, there is still some organization to the spongy bone. Now, all the rods that look like they go in any particular direction, they're called the trabeculae. I was thinking like Alex Trebek. Um, they align, these rods try to align along lines of stress. And I'm like, so if we split apart our long bone, a lot of these trabeculae, these rods, go in certain directions. Now, these blue lines are your lines of stress. When, first, anyone know what type of, what bone is this? This is your femur. Use your head and your neck and the greater chelsea, I think. Um, when you walk, you're putting a lot of stress down on your bone, all the way down into that femur. And I'm like, and a lot of it's going into the head. Well, there's a narrow part right there, which makes it prone to what? Prone to injury, prone to breaking right there. And I'm like, we've got a lot of pressure that we have to put on there. And I'm like, so what the spongy bone does, because it looks all totally irregular, it tries to, tries to take all the weight you put on it and send it to, if it can, the compact bone. It's almost like I'm going to take this weight and I'm going to try to distribute it with my lines of trabeculae and I'm going to put it through these lines of stress where I'm putting the majority of stress on the bone. It arranges that trabeculae in these little lines. And I'm like to try to alleviate the stress that's on the bone to another part of the bone to resist fracturing. Now, there's no osteons. There's nothing that looks like tree rings. And I'm like completely... There are some circular things in there. If I split apart a trabecula, there's no central canal. And I'm like, and there's some other structures that are missing too. Um, but we do find osteoblasts, osteoclasts, osteocytes. We still find all the normal cells in our spongy bone that we find in other bone. Um, we also have lots and lots of blood supply because what's made here within the ends of our long bone? Red blood vessels, or red blood cells. And I'm like, because we've got, you know, that's your red bone marrow find in the, found in the spongy bone. You have lots of blood supply, lots of capillaries that are going there to uptake and move all these new blood cells. Oops, I thought I had one picture. I think I smushed a picture under here. Ready for some reviews before you leave? Pull out your colored note cards. The first one, fibrocartilage, would be found at which location? Pink, orange, yellow, or green? Think fibro, nice and tough. So you find it in the knee. And I'm like, the fibrocartilage, you find it in the knee and your intervertebral discs and your pubic symphysis. It's the toughest of the cartilage. Which of these is not a type of bone cell that we talked about today? Yeah, that is just made up word. Um, a group of concentric rings of bone matrix comprising the functional unit of long bones, really long way of wording this, it's called a what? A whole bunch of rings. A group of rings though, not the individual rings. Not pink. 
because it's a group of rings, is the osteon. <coughs> Adjacent osteocytes communicate via gap junctions, the little tiny spaces found where? So what do osteocytes use to communicate? They use the green, they use the little tiny canal. The lacuna are spaces that you find the uh, uh, osteocytes, but they use the little canals, the canaliculi that communicate with each other. The principal component of bone that contributes to its hardness. It is the calcium. It's like the, re you know, it's found in the main structure that has lots, you know, lots of calcium. It's calcium. Found in a structure called calcium hydroxyapatite. Calcium makes your bone hard. What would long bone growth look like in an individual whose cartilage and the epiphyseal disc or plate stopped dividing? What would happen? It's in the disc where you find cartilage, and that's where your bones grow longer. If those cells stop growing, and that physical plate or disc, and I'm like, your bones stopped growing. They're not getting longer anymore. Which of the following bone cell types is responsible for initiating ossification of bone? It is the osteoblast that I'm like, they're building the bone. So the initial ossification of bone, they're building bone. You've got your osteoblast. Couple more. In a patient, I would expect a, expect a hormone question on your exam on Tuesday, whether it's calcitonin or parathyroid. I'm like, in a patient whose parathyroid glands have been removed, you would expect the person's blood calcium levels to what? And yes, you guys are all getting it. I'm like, it would decrease because the parathyroid hormone is the one that says, so let's break down bone to increase calcium. If you don't have any parathyroid, you're not going to break down bone and your calcium levels are going down. Uh, calcium's homeostatic importance to the body is primarily what? Why do we need calcium? I was going to say, both my A and C should be like both pink and yellow. I didn't think that. Not that it's that one anyways, but it's orange. And I'm like, is the function in numerous metabolic activities, muscles, blood things, and like cells. We need calcium lots of places. Last question. Uh, disease caused by vitamin D deficiency in children. Terms what? I was going to say, it's a little tricky. I'm like, I'm not saying, like, it is rickets. I was going to say, which is technically also considered, I mean, the disease is called rickets. Osteomalacious means the same thing. Your bones are softening. 